Well, hi everybody. I'm Julia Charlton of Charlton's, a law firm in Hong Kong, and I'm so pleased to be with you here today for a virtual roundtable on listing Asian companies on the Aquis market in the UK. As we all know, the UK is currently the world's largest, sixth largest economy, and London, its capital, is a leading international financial centre for financial and professional services, and it's home to the European headquarters of 40% of the world's top companies. It's a top-ranking European centre for tech innovation. It's attracted 3.1 billion US dollars of fintech investments in the first half of 2022, with London tech firms receiving 25.5 billion US dollars in investment in 2021 and ranking fourth globally for VC investment in the same year. London also continues to lead the world as the top destination for foreign investment in financial and professional services, attracting 114 projects last year, over a billion pounds worth of investment in 2021, and having the largest number of financial professional service FDI projects in Europe, and second in the world after the US. The London Stock Exchange, which we've all heard of, is one of the world's oldest stock exchanges, dating back more than 300 years, operating a broad range of international equity, fixed income exchange, traded funds, exchange traded products, foreign exchange markets, etc. However, we also have the London-based Aquis Exchange, another stock exchange group in the UK, and this operates three divisions. The Aquis Exchange, a pan-European cash equities trading business, with, which primarily facilitates the trading of pan-European shares and was formed as the initial basis of Aquis. The primary UK stock market, Aquis Stock Exchange, which was acquired with an aim to compete for IPOs and improve secondary trading, and Aquis Technologies, which develops proprietary exchange technologies and subsequently adapts these for third-party clients, and it's used to power the Aquis Exchange. Aquis is authorised and regulated by the UK FCA and the French authorities. The Aquis Stock Exchange itself comprises a main market and a growth market separated into two categories. Apex, aimed at more established companies ex executing clearly um, defined growth strategies, and Access, aimed at companies at an earlier stage of their growth and investors who are likely to take a longer term view. The Aquis Exchange itself had a revenue of over £5 million in the first half of 2022. As of October this year, Aquis European Entities um, market share was five, over 5% 5 and ranked 7th. The total value of securities traded on the Aquis Exchange as of the 30th of June this year was £1.7 billion, about £15 billion Hong Kong dollars, with 104 securities listed spanning 26 different sectors. It also attracted 12 IPOs in the first half of 2022. During the same period, the average market cap of all Aquis Stock Exchange's stocks stood at about £14 million, pounds, about £130 million um, Hong Kong dollars, and those of its companies on the apex category of its growth market averaged £43 million, pounds, about for £400 million Hong Kong dollars. Then Aquis Technologies also posted increase in revenue to over a million pounds in the first half. So I'm delighted and honoured to welcome our panel today, Alistair Haynes, who's the founder and CEO of Aquis Exchange PLC, chairman of the City UK's new business council, and he currently sits on the FCA's practitioners panel. He's also the former CEO of ChiX Europe and ITG International, with over 30 years of experience in the city, and he's held senior positions at a number of investment banks, including HSBC and UBS. Victoria Young Husband is a highly experienced corporate lawyer admitted both in Hong Kong and the UK, and she's currently a non-resident partner of Speechley, Charles Russell Speechley's Hong Kong office. She's got huge experience in the London and Hong Kong capital markets. Andrew Racket is the head of corporate finance at VSA Capital, an international investment banking and broking firm based in the UK. His 30-year career spans uh, the full range of public and private company M&A, advisory fundraising, having worked with both Hong Kong and mainland Chinese companies advising on IPOs and company takeovers. He also has significant experience in assisting Asian companies to navigate the requirements of UK regulation and investment. And we also have joining our panel later on, Phil, Philip Olm, who's the Managing Director of Regulation responsible for policy development 
in respect of the rules of the Aqua Stock Exchange. I'll tell you a little bit more about Philip later on before we start the panel. So I'll now hand over to Alistair for his introduction and overview of the Aquas Exchange. Julia, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, we've got a presentation. What I want to talk to you about today is uh, Aquis, the, uh, the, the company, uh, why we think we can help you and why we are changing primary markets and secondary markets. And why I believe very, very strongly in the um, ability that public markets should be used to raise uh, capital for businesses. That is the raison d'etre of being a stock exchange. Um, Julia, as you said, Aquis Exchange runs three businesses. The original business, where we are the uh, uh, we, we are the trading platform for the top two and a half thousand stocks across seventeen European markets. We have the second largest liquidity pool of any exchange in Europe, and as you said, we execute about five and a half percent of all trading across Europe. That's one in 20 transactions in every equity traded in the European markets actually crosses over and is traded by on the Aquis Exchange. Um, that means that we're doing about two and a half billion dollars, US dollars uh, of business every single day. Um, and that ranks us as the sixth or seventh largest exchange group in Europe. The Aquis Technologies business is something which we run our own platform on. But also, we have been selling and been absolute breaking technology in the cloud space, working with Amazon Web Services, working with the Singapore Exchange to develop a completely new type of technology. And that becomes incredibly relevant when it comes around to the stock exchange business. The majority of stock exchanges around the world, the national markets, operate on 25 to 30 year old technology. If you imagine driving a car and competing in today's markets and today's racing or driving in a 25 year old car, you would absolutely not be creating the market of the future. And this is exactly the backbone of Aquis is we are a fintech business. We are a technology development business and we license that and sell those to new exchanges, startup exchanges, as well as starting to sell to national exchanges around the world. But what I really want to talk about today is Aquis Stock Exchange. This is the primary market. And one of the real reasons we want to do this is having seen what's happened in the United States with the competitive tension between the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, the innovation that's created by that has made the United States the central place to take businesses, growth businesses. And that is a real problem for Europe and it's a real problem for Asia. And what Aquis's purpose here is to create that competitive tension with the London Stock Exchange to innovate, work on the latest technology and develop a method whereby we can get capital to growth businesses. Julie, if you could just turn to the next slide. We want to be the home of growth companies. We have created a market that is primary and secondary for both equity and debt. We are a recognized investment exchange. And that means, although there are a number of RIEs in the UK, people uh, like the London Metal Exchange or CBOE that operate uh, an ETF listing market, we are the only other exchange, stock exchange in the UK that is actually licensed to list companies, IPO companies into, uh, into a marketplace. Um, I have a real belief that the United Kingdom is an amazing country for startup capital. Any entrepreneur, I've done it myself, through EIS and through SEIS can raise capital um, through a good business idea and through the tax advantages um, at this early stage. Where we are really bad as a country, and I've mentioned this a lot through the City UK to government, to the Treasury and to the regulators, is we are extremely poor in scale up capital. So the point in time when a company has started to prove itself becomes slightly less risky, the scale up capital is absolutely essential. And the public markets are not used for scale up capital. We know this very well ourselves because we went public four years ago. The process took nine months. The cost was something in the region of 1.3, 1.5 million pounds. And today I get a spread in our stock, something in the region of 10 to 20 percent wide. Now, I'm Scottish by birth, and I will say that Scottish pe people are particularly canny with their with their money. And, and, and the issue here is that 
we don't, I don't think that was particularly great value. So why would a company, a growth business, a fast growing company want to choose the public markets? And what we need to do is be able to change the, um, the, 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 not lower the standards, but make regulation that is proportionate and to make trading ne mechanisms that are appropriate for these types of businesses. If we just move to the next slide. So what we've done is I believe that companies are very much like children. They start small, they grow and ultimately mature. When we have our children, we send them off to a primary school. And at a primary school, you do not learn sort of Thucydides and excellence of the learning that we would know at a, at, a, at a secondary school. We teach them how to learn and they're taught in a specific way. When we move our children to a secondary school, we put more pressure on them. We give them homework. We protect them. But we certainly they have a different form of learning. And that is where education really starts. And ultimately, we move them to university, which is all self-learning under the guidance of a professor. And that is a very different mechanism of teaching. Now, what we do in the United Kingdom, if we think of companies being very much like children, is we take these children and we put these companies, take these companies, and we make them, put them straight into university. We give them a regulatory standard that every company has to be like HSBC or BP or Vodafone or Shell or whatever. And that isn't appropriate for the size of the business. Now, people immediately turn around and say, well, that means you're lowering standards. It doesn't mean that at all. Aquis maintains incredibly high standards, but it uses rules and regulations that are proportionate for the company and the size of the company. No company that has six or seven staff that is actually growing incredibly quickly, is looking to scale up, wants to have audit and remuneration committees, uh, nomination and remuneration committees of five, six, seven people, as you would have to do as a FTSE 100 company. Governance is critical, but it doesn't, ha it has to be proportionate. So by doing this and by changing the rules and regulations, what we've done is we've created our own school, an access segment, which is a primary school, which is where you learn to be a public company. So you go into the public market, you become a public company, but we have a set of rules there that are different. In other words, the way we teach you, you learn to become that public company's company so you can become and grow up to your billion dollar valuation or so. So what we do, and, and we'll cover this in, in, in a second, in access, the market is, has a set of rules where you don't have to take a corporate governance code. You don't have to have a large free float. Your real concentration at that stage is as a public company being fully disclosed, but at the same time, being able to grow your business and focus your management's attention on growing that business. Once you've achieved, and we have around about 80 companies today in this segment, once you've achieved a particular size and a particular level, and you've proved to us that you are a mature enough company to grow into the next segment, we move your school for you and we take you into the apex segment. Now here, just like in a school, we do all sorts of things that protect you. We ban short selling. We give a different set of rules. Your free float has to be larger. And those rules become more appropriate and we protect you. Um, in, 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 a, in, a, in various ways, and we'll go through this. But with Apex, you can stay in this market until you're at least a billion dollars or billion pounds. At that level, you then have to move up into the main market. So what we're doing here is we're transforming the way that capital, that scale up capital can actually be done by companies that are looking to grow. We could just move to the next uh, slide. Thank you very much. So here we look at the difference between us, the segments that we have, the AIM market, and the main standard listing. So if we look just at some of the key things here, you look at where the free float is. Liquidity is incredibly important to companies as they mature, but liquidity is less important at companies in their micro cap stage. So on access, where we have these 80 companies with an average market cap of about 14 to 20 million pounds, actually, it's not liquidity that's the issue. The point is you have access to capital that is available by being public. So we don't insist on you having a free float of greater than 10%. You can keep that 
um, at 10 percent. It's when you move to access, or sorry, to apex, that it's the 25 percent level. We don't require you to have three years of trading history. Two years is fully acceptable. We have accounting standards that are very different. When the moment we went and we are quoted on the AIM market, we had to move and change to IFRS. Many companies at an early stage are very happy on GAAP. And we accept GAAP. So there are fundamental differences between what we do and what other markets do. But the prime one is actually we don't have the nomad structure. Now, on the 14th of June 2018 was a memorable day for me because any entrepreneur who floats their company, it's a fantastic moment. And I was very kindly asked by the London Stock Exchange to go and open the market on that day. I met lots of dignitaries. I drank champagne. They gave me canopies. I pushed the button and it was a great day. They forgot to tell me, though, that it's actually a leaving party because in effect with the nomad structure, there is no conversation that I can have with the stock exchange. And as AIM is our regulator, that I feel is a very, very poor decision. At Aquis, we believe strongly in relationships. We want to work with the companies before they IPO. We want to work with their advisors and brokers before and during the IPO. And we want to continue those relationships after the IPO. Why? Because we are the regulator. And what I like about this is this is a real symbiotic relationship. This relationship is we want companies on our market, the home of growth companies, to grow and succeed. It is in my interest that that happens without lowering standards, but by having that conversation. And it is really important that the companies want us to grow because with it, they will get higher ratings, just as NASDAQ did in the 1990s and the early 2000s. As these companies grew, the market grew and it became more effective and better for those companies on it. So we have this truly symbiotic relationship. Just like to flick over to the next slide, please. So what are the advantages? Why would somebody pick Aquis over anywhere else? Well, we talked very briefly about the access and the Apex segment. In the Apex segment, we banned short selling. I feel very strongly about that. And people say, well, in microcap, there's very little short selling. You'll be surprised how many companies in the range of 100 million to six, 700 million market cap actually have short selling against them. Particularly, we saw this during the pandemic where you may be a great business, but actually as a result of the sector you're in, people decide to sell short. That means because these are not hugely liquid stocks, it means stock price will fall. Your cost of capital to a business rises. Your staff who are incentivized by their option scheme lose out and sometimes leave. The entrepreneur doesn't succeed. The company fails. The UK economy is worse off to the benefit of the few who have sold short. Now, I'm not anti short selling in large cap businesses, but I'm very anti the ability to short sell as a company is growing in the same way as that I believe in education that children should be protected whilst they're at school. And we do exactly that. We incentivize these companies by having a spread no more than 5%. No more than 5% because we have a market maker scheme. And with the technology we've got, watch this space over the coming year or two years, where we're working heavily with the regulator and the treasury in order to try and change and introduce much newer mechanisms to promote liquidity in the trading of these stocks. We've done it in the large cap, as I said, in the large caps in the Aquis Exchange business, where we have the second largest liquidity pool in the whole of Europe. I think we can achieve this in the small cap, small cap and the growth markets. The next thing that's really important to me is get the public back into public markets. There's a complete irony that as an individual investor, I can buy shares in a private company at any point in time. But the moment that company decides to IPO, I'm banned from trading that because of things like um, the, the, uh, the financial promotions that doesn't allow retail investors or private investors to participate in an IPO. And yet a few seconds after the company has gone public, I can then invest. So the public, in effect, have been cut out of the IPO process. Now, I'm not saying that the public is the only source of capital for businesses. But it's a very important source for the liquidity in the secondary market. And we have worked very, very hard in connecting almost every online broker 
enforcing and changing the rules within Treasury and the regulator to get retail into the IPOs. We believe in transparency. And we, as I said before, we strongly believe in the relationship. And of course, the technology is absolutely essential. To work on the latest technology to be able to connect people is vitally important for any stock exchange. If you're going to build the stock exchange of the future, it has to be built on a very strong foundation of efficiency, effectiveness, and strong technology. If we could just move into the next slide. So why IPO? Now, I was asked that question many, many times, particularly as we were a young company at the time. This was four and a bit, four years ago, four and a bit years ago. Um, our market cap at the time was around about 70 million, something like that. But actually, the benefit of an IPO is it raised the profile. As a company, and ironically, you can raise capital as a private company, but the ability to have that capital at your fingertips as a public market changed the perception of people who used us for, say, our technology business. All of a sudden, as a public company, bigger companies started to take us really seriously. We could attract new capital for scale up. This is the point that is most significant. It's the point we keep on raising to government. And there's never been a more important time post Brexit, post pandemic, and with a war in Europe going on for companies to raise capital and to get this scale up capital. It's a real problem for the government and they're looking for solutions. And the great news is we have the Acquis Stock Exchange as a solution. So to be able to increase, diversify your shareholder base by raising capital from a wide variety of retail and institutions is essential in building business. We've seen a de-equitization in equities for the last 50 years, not since 2008 and the banking crisis. We do not want to continue to see that because it's essential for pension funds, for investment companies to be able to continue to invest in growth businesses. And one thing that people often mistake is they think that, well, I'll invest in large caps, but I won't invest in small caps. But historically, over the last 100 years, and you can look at evidence from dimensional fund advisors, that the best performing asset class has been a portfolio of value and growth, small cap and micro cap companies. Accessing liquidity, essential. But be careful what liquidity means. Early stage companies, liquidity is never going to be particularly high. Because if you have a 90% held of, uh, you know, a 10% free flow and 90% of the company is tightly held, you are not going to see excessive and extraordinary trading, but you will have a live valuation of your company. And that is really important because it incentivizes your employees in the form of option schemes and stuff. But the other thing that I think is a misnomer is you do retain control of your company. Many, many friends of mine as entrepreneurs have gone out and seen venture capital. You see these people sitting on boards. You see them almost taking control of the business. You can't do what you want to do when you as an entrepreneur want to do it. As a public company, whether you're in Access or whether you're in Apex, you can still maintain control of your business. If we can go to the next slide, the seven steps to IPO. Well, you have to meet with Aquis to start with. Unlike other exchanges around the world, we want to see you because we actually need to make a judgment as well. Not only you about us, but we need to make a judgment about you because we want growth businesses. We want to be seen as the market for the new economy, to be able to see companies that are truly going to grow and actually evidence that to us. So we want to hear your story directly from you rather than through your advisors or the brokers. You then have to appoint a corporate advisor, a lawyer, and an accountant. Now, we currently have 37 corporate advisors. Uh, we have 21 uh, corporate brokers, and we have a long list of great lawyers and accountants who actively work with the Acquis Stock Exchange. And then what will happen is your advisors will review the documentation that is needed. They will start talking to us and they will decide whether you are able to meet our regulatory standards. And I think, again, there's a misconception out there that because of the past, and we bought this company for a pound two and a half years ago, 
obviously, if you buy something for a pound, we're buying the regulatory status. We're not necessarily buying what it was. And it used to be known as OFX plus markets, ISDX, um, NEX, etc. This time, it's incredibly different. This time, we bought it for the license. We know what we wanted to do. We've put our own technology. We have a distinct set of rules that differentiates from us, from others. And we're starting to see enormous growth. This year, we've done more IPOs than AIM, 21. We have over 50 companies in our sales pipeline, and that is growing incredibly quickly. And we do turn a lot of companies down because I think in this area, there are a lot of people who think they don't have to disclose. They don't want to meet the standards and we will not lower our standards. We have fine people, we find brokers and we find advisors. So we maintain those standards, but also with a much, much closer relationship than you'll ever see from the regulatory team of most of the national stock exchanges around the world. Having raised your capital, you then have a market notice. You'll have a regulatory review. Now, that is something that I do not sit on. It's something that Philip, who runs our regulation, does not sit on. It's an independent review done by the Primary Markets Acceptance Committee. And that's a really important statement because it is really essential that these companies, that they are looked at in an independent way by a group of people, by people on our board, by other executives, our chief financial officer, to make quite certain that we, who have been keen, have not missed anything in that organization. That company can get turned down at the last moment, but in almost every case, we've made quite certain with the advisors and the brokers that it doesn't. And that's important because, as I said, when we spent our one and a half million pounds or so, I didn't want to see the taxi meter running early unless I knew I had a really, really good chance of getting onto the marketplace. And that is why the dialogue is so important. Once your IPO day is complete, you'll have a lot of fun because you can come to our office and our ceremony, unlike the London Stock Exchange or many exchanges around the, around the world, you ring a bell, we have this enormous gong. And I think Andrew, who has seen it and rung it a few times, um, it, it sort of sends the whole building into sort of vibrations and it's great fun. We'll film it for you and it's a great day. So those are the seven steps to the IPO. I just wanna finish on a slide, if you can just show the next one about how important technology and connectivity is. I put this up there, I don't expect anybody to be reading all the names on here, but it is essential. If you're gonna run a stock exchange, you have to have the connectivity of the online brokers. When we started, when we bought this business, it was connected to one. Today, every major online broker is on board. AJ Bell, Barclays, Jarvis, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, Interactive Investor, and IG is about to start, and Halifax, the last of the large ones, is, um, is, is currently talking to us. We had hardly any data vendors. We had hardly any market makers, corporate advisors. In fact, that list, two and a bit years ago, was six people. And in fact, I think there are others on there that aren't even there at the moment. So the point is, bringing in the right technology that can connect thousands, if not millions of people in the retail world, hundreds of people in the market making corporate advisor stakeholder world is absolutely critical. By doing that, and by having the right set of rules, by positioning ourselves to be the exchange for scale up capital for growth businesses, we can create a NASDAQ in Europe. A NASDAQ that has created innovation from the New York Stock Exchange and has made the United States the place to access capital in the public markets today. I want to change that. And I believe very, very strongly that the Aquis Exchange Group can do that. I shall pass over now to uh, back to yourself, Julia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair. That was very inspiring. And uh, we love gongs in Hong Kong, so that all sounds very good. We'd like that. <laughs> so um, I'll now welcome Victoria Young Husband to talk about listing Asian companies on Aquis um, from a legal and regulatory point of view. So Victoria has been a lawyer for over 30 years. She specializes in advising investment funds, managers, advisors on all aspects of from setup, fundraising, M&A, and so on, as well as capital markets. She's a member of the Company Law um, Committee and the Company of London Law Society, 
and the Technical Committee of the Association of Investment Companies. She's also ranked as a leading individual in Chambers and Legal 500. So Victoria, over to you. Thank you, Julia. And thank you, Alistair, for a very inspiring um, talk. I, um, can I have my first slide, please? Um, if the next slide. Thank you. Um, just an agenda, and I will uh, be talking quite fast through, through this. Um, I should say that it's a, a great thrill for me to be speaking um, to the Asian market. I'm going to be in Hong Kong next week. I am a, a, a partner, a non-resident partner in our Hong Kong office, which we opened well, more than five years ago and became a Hong Kong law firm. Um, our, first, our second anniversary will be 1st December. Um, and, uh, it, it, and, and I worked in Hong Kong um, more years ago now than I wish. But it's the first time for me since um, pre-COVID, so it's really exciting. But just talking about um, what, what you'd be looking at from a legal point of view on listing, um, I'm going to talk first of all about what you should be thinking about before you start the process and in conjunction with when you're talking with Aquis themselves. Then um, the legal aspects of the admission process and the all important admission document, other key documents, and a very brief word on continuing obligations. So next slide, please. So um, corporate structure is important and equally if you were going on to the Hong Kong market, but will you need a new holding company? And I think um, Andrew is going to be talking a bit more about this, but it does need to be in a jurisdiction that investors are comfortable. And I've mentioned Crest eligibility, Crest being our for, for electronic trading. Um, you're only eligible for direct mem for your shares to be traded directly on Crest if the company is incorporated in the UK. Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, or the Republic of Ireland. If it's incorporated elsewhere, you're, you're, um, there'll be depository interests um, on Crest and not shares. If you're a specialist issuer, um, the UK regulator, FCA, has set out in its technical note the additional requirements, which also apply um, in regard to Aquis. And I've listed the, the, the specialist issuers, that most of which are probably fairly um, relevant to Asian issuers, property, mineral companies, which includes oil and gas, scientific research-based startups, and shipping. Next slide, please. Admission process, and these are sort of partly preliminaries, if you like. It's important to have a chairman um, and or probably and I think non-executive directors who are familiar with the London market. Also important that your executive management, at least some of them are, are very fluent in English. Um, that only one non-executive director is required for the um, access market although I think you might come under pressure to have more than one. I've put on the slide director's questionnaires. It's very important for your corporate advisor and ultimately for the exchange that um, your directors disclose anything that might cause um, a problem later in the process. And they are they, they are a bit of a headache to, to complete, but they are essential to make sure you have the right people running the company. Accounts, um, you, you could have, if your accounts are not currently um, made up for IFRS, UK GAP, or international accounting standards equivalent, you would have to restate your last set of audited accounts um, so that they comply with the standard that you are adopting for admission. 
reporting accountants play a very important role, partly in the long form report, which again, both Aquis and your corporate advisor will be very interested in. A working capital report, because in your admission document, you have to say that you, you'll have sufficient working capital for at least 12 months from the date of admission. Another important document is the memorandum, the FPPP, which sets out the controls and procedures you have to ensure that at any time you've got an accurate view of your financial position and prospects. And there'll be comfort letters, in fact, not only from the accountants, but from the accountants in particular, that on extraction of financial information in the admission document, and that there's been no significant change since your last set of accounts. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the admission document contain? And um, both Alistair set the scene and Philip could probably, would probably say more about it, but it is designed to, to say no more than is essential for investors to understand the business. There is prescribed content, um, which set out in Appendix 1 and Table A to the rules, and there's an additional information requirement, and I've, I've put a link to the um, template. So in, in the interest of making it valuable and not too long, there's a, a limit on the pages that you can give on the description of the business strategy, performance, and environment. Your risk factors must be really specific and no more than 15. I've mentioned accounts and working capital. You have to set out your dividend policy. And if you're a startup business, the lock-in agreements with related parties for 12 months from admission. Next slide, please. Other key documents. Um, Placing or introduction agreement, and Alistair mentioned the difficulty in um, retail investors participating initially. If you were to get retail investors, you'd be subject to the prospectus rules, although some um, issuers in the UK market now have uh, um, limit the retail offer to eight million um, pounds and do it through an organization, a platform called Primary Bid. So it's possible, um, but that tends to be more expensive and you don't get many retail investors. So better just to get yourself on the market and then your retail investors can access through, through the platforms that Alistair mentioned. Um, the placing agreement will require reps and warranties from the, from the executive management, limited ones from the non-execs and indemnities. Uh, verification notes are pretty key to make sure that the information in the admission document is, can, um, is as accurate as can be and, and supports that information. Advisors engagement letters are early in the process, again, important. Um, you look for exclusivity and indemnities if you're acting for the issuer. Director's service agreements and letters of appointment also required. Um, corporate, corporate governance, uh, and I note that Alistair said you shouldn't need committees. I think you might expect to have an audit committee um, and matters reserved to the board, um, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that for discussion. Very important to have the registrar who will manage the CREST process and a receiving agent if you're raising money. So going back to CREST, the application form. Announcements required by the rules, and you may want to have an intention to float announcement. Uh, next page, please. 
So just to wrap up con on continuing obligations, you're obliged to have a corporate advisor and um, Andrew Racker will be speaking about the role. I could, I've mentioned the market abuse regulation, which applies to Aquis in the same way as it applies to the London Stock Exchange quoted companies. I could, and I have quite frequently, um, talk for a whole hour about this, and I'm not going to, but I wanted to um, highlight things which may be slightly different from what you're used to. If there is inside information within the company, the company is obliged to uh, have a, to, to um, prepare an insider list and keep it in uh, a form with names, addresses, home, phone numbers, and when somebody became an insider. Um, it's really important because the FCA is the, um, the regulator, if you like, of this market. And if they see a spike in trading, one of the first things they ask is who knew what, when, and your insider list is, is a good record of that. Um, there is, um, for directors and um, senior executive management, called persons directing managerial responsibilities or PDMRs have specific disclosure obligations. Um, and so do uh, persons closely associated with them, which is um, basically family, family trusts and um, trustees. It's quite a complicated definition. You have to um, report on FCA form PDMR, any, any trades at all, including options, grants. And um, you will be advised to have a dealing code because um, directors and senior managers must not deal in the 30 days prior to announcement of final and half yearly results and probably a compliance manual. And there is some FCA guidance on, on this. Um, one important point is that there's an obligation to disclose inside information as soon as possible. Um, there, is, there are circumstances when at the company's own risk, they can delay disclosure, including um, when they're negotiating a deal and, and premature disclosure would, would prejudice it. With major shareholder notifications, but only for companies that are incorporated in the UK, and the threshold here is 3% and every 1% above it. And it applies both to shares and to um, certain derivative instruments. I should mention the financial report publication deadlines, which is six months after the year end for annual reports and three months for half year. And importantly, you are required to maintain a website, um, which should give investors most of the information they need to know. I haven't mentioned related party transactions or connected transactions for Hong Kong, which you would expect to see, but I think at this stage, I must hand over to Andrew Racker. Thank you. Um, next slide is just any questions and my details, which you maybe we should have the next slide and then hand over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. That was really interesting. And I think there's an awful lot we can recognize in that from um, the Hong Kong perspective, although the list of insiders is interesting and probably very useful. It's probably something which a lot of Hong Kong listed companies might find useful, even if they don't actually have to do that. They do have to identify this group of people anyway. Um, so finally, we'll turn to Andrew, who's going to tell us about raising capital in London. As I mentioned earlier, Andrew's been in corporate finance for over 30 years. He currently heads the corporate finance team at VSA Capital. He started his career as an international investment banker at Barclays de Zoot Wed in, and worked in corporate finance, leveraged and project finance, and gained further experience in international professional services firms, including Arthur Anderson and Ernst & Young. He's also acted as a corporate advisor on the Aquis growth market and as a sponsor of the main market of the London Stock Exchange. So, Andrew, over to you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Julia. Thanks also to Victoria for going through the regulatory aspects of this. If you could uh, just put up uh, my slides, that would be uh, great. So raising capital in London. Um, let me talk a little bit just about VSA to set the context. If you could go on to the slide. VSA Capital, if you to the next slide, please. The VSA Capital, we're an investment banking and broking firm. We're headquartered in the city of London, but we also have an office in Shanghai, um, which we established a number of years ago. And we've operated uh, in China, uh, in Hong Kong for over 30 years, really, with many, a range of business contacts. So we're very enthusiastic about the opportunities that are presented by Asian companies. We provide a full range of corporate finance and broking fundraising advisory services. Uh, and we have a particular understanding of uh, how Asian companies and Asian advisors operate because there are cultural differences and it's important to bear those in mind in trying to ensure success uh, here in the UK. Uh, VSA Capital is a, an Aquis corporate advisor. We created the VSA Capital Aquis Apex Index, uh, which is an information tool to help investors. Uh, and of course, that's going to be developed as Aquis itself uh, develops. Uh, Victoria's talked about the regulations and the rules. It, it, there's a lot to, to navigate there. Um, we've worked with Charles Wilson Speechley on many occasions, and I have to say, uh, each one of those occasions has been very professional, mm -hmm. uh, and we've they, they've made major contributions to the success of the projects we've worked with them on. So having Charles Wilson Speechley on the ticket is, is a tremendously beneficial um, thing to do. Our role as a corporate advisor is to help make a success of the IPO. Uh, and people think that it's just a process, uh, and to a great degree it is. Victoria talked a lot about what's involved. But actually it's more than a process, it's a journey that you have to go through and you've got to navigate so much uh, on that journey to make a success of it. And our job is to help make a success. Now, it may not uh, be evident from my youthful experience and vigor, but I worked on my first IPO in 1988. And I've worked, I, I stopped uh, counting how many IPOs I've worked on many, many years ago. And I've, I've done uh, IPOs on all the different markets uh, in the UK over that period. And really, uh, the thing about Aquis is that it's a market you can get enthusiastic about. It's, if it didn't exist, in the UK, it would have to be invented. And what I'd like to do is to explain why uh, it's necessary, what the context is in the UK, why Aquis is so important. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about how do you make a success uh, of this journey. So talking about Aquis, an unusual place might be to start talking about the alternatives to Aquis before we actually uh, get on to the uh, other, uh, get on to the benefits of Aquis. So if I could just turn on to the next slide, I'd like to just provide an overview of AIM. Now, AIM was established uh, over 25 years ago. It's managed by the London Stock Exchange. Um, so it has a similar status to Aquis. The regulation and compliance uh, for, uh, on that market is devolved by the Stock Exchange to the nominated advisor or nomad. And I know many people are familiar with that. The primary duty of care by the nomad is not to the company, it's to the London Stock Exchange. Now that immediately creates an environment, a regime that becomes very regulatory, quite intense. And there has been an increasing regulatory burden on both AIM companies and nomads over the years. Um, it has become a very demanding regulatory regime and that can make it quite difficult for companies that are in fast growth phase trying to navigate through uh, the regulatory environment and make a success of their businesses. The hurdle to join the AIM market has become higher. Um, AIM has become much more selective, much more careful about new entrants. Um, nomads are not keen on Asian companies, it's a fact. Uh, and this has been, uh, this has evolved over the years. Uh, and so it is a very difficult um, environment to try and navigate if you were a company or an advisor looking to explore AIM as a possibility. Uh, and Alistair has talked about how difficult it can be liaising with the AIM team and the London Stock Exchange. And of course, also a further regulatory uh, obstacle is the, the fact that 
free float and liquidity are becoming increasingly important on AIM. Um, and it becomes a little bit of a barrier that AIM uses to prevent companies from, from joining it. So AIM is challenging. Let's turn to the next slide. And I'd like to talk about the main market. It's London Stock Exchange main market, but actually it's regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. It's not regulated by the LSE. And the Financial Conduct Authority um, has made has been increasingly um, intense on the way that it uh, challenges those companies that are seeking to list and they're giving increasing scrutiny very considerable scrutiny of those companies to uh, be, before they get onto that market to join that market the main market you need an fca approved prospectus and the, there are many tales that exist that you, you know, lots of anecdotes of companies that have taken months and indeed over a year to get a prospectus approved by the FCA to get the, onto the main market. The FCA, main, the, the main market, the FCA, the way they're looking at it, that's been evolving quite a lot rapidly. And they've been introduced new rules and they're reviewing the way that the market operates. To get onto the main market now, there is a minimum market capitalization required of 30 million pounds, which equates to around 270 million Hong Kong dollars. So that immediately demonstrates that there's a much higher hurdle to get onto that market. And then another thing that with standard listings, they've been so popular in the past with many overseas companies considering standard listings. But the standard listing concept came about as a result of us being in the U European Union. And it was a listing that was equivalent throughout all of Europe, but had very minimal standards. Now, the FCA, in undertaking its review, doesn't really know what to do with it. But what it has stated is that in the absence of a requirement to have a listing venue that is based on European uh, minimum standards, it is no longer clear what purpose such a standard listing would serve for equity shares in the UK. Now, it's not yet been determined, but my view is that because the FCA has made it abundantly clear to people that for smaller growth companies, there are existing markets, AIM and Aquis. Therefore, as far as I can see, they're, they're, I believe, and this is a personal view, but I believe the standard listings will come to an end. So I believe that no longer will that be an option for companies, overseas companies, uh, coming to the UK, unless they were very substantial and were willing to go on to the premium listing with all of the regulatory obligations that that requires, including appointing an FCA sponsor. So therefore, that sets the, the, the context. Let's look a little bit more about why Aquis uh, is a market that companies really seriously have to consider. We can turn on to the next slide. VSA has worked on Aquis, with Aquis, on a number of listings. Indeed, we, we also are Aquis Corporate Advisor to the Aquis uh, PLC itself. Uh, and there are a number of advantages uh, to Aquis, a number of great attractions. The regulatory regime is much more suited to growth companies. The Aquis team have a commercial mindset, a can-do attitude, and that really makes a difference when interacting with them on behalf of companies. The relationship between the exchange and, and, and companies and advisors is, is much more collaborative. It's a partnership. It's quicker, less expensive to list. As, as Alistair went to, to emphasize, went to great pains to emphasize, is that there is virtually full connectivity now and support being established with institutional investors and also all of the retail platforms. It's, it's not complete yet, but it's, it's well on the way. And that's making a massive difference to what has been there before. And with superior technology, uh, Aquis is competing with, uh, with the other exchanges and is attracting increasing trading volumes. Aquis it, it has got massive momentum and that can be seen from its public statements. And on the basis that elephants can't gallop, well, Aquis is much more nimble, much more responsive to the needs of companies and to advisors like us who represent companies onto that exchange. So we're very enthusiastic about it. And an important consideration for investors is that Aquis 
provides the same suite of tax incentives and benefits that you get on A. So for example, if you hold your shares um, in Aquis listed companies for two years, then uh, such shares are exempt from uh, inheritance tax in the UK, which of course is a massive uh, incentive. And there's no stamp duty on trading of those shares. So turning over to the next slide, if you accept from what you've heard today that Aquis is a real alternative uh, to AIM, um, let, let's not kid ourselves that, that, that you know, there's a lot to be done to make a company attractive and to succeed on floating in the UK. Investors in the UK are very discerning. So let's talk about some top tips that I've identified that the business that you're considering listing on in the UK has to consider. There's got to be a credible reason to be listed in the UK. What does that mean? It means that when an investor uh, in the UK meets a company, they've got to ask the question, well, why are you listing in the UK? What is the rationale for it? There's got to be a good rationale. Now, if there are connections with the UK, if there's trading with the UK or Europe, uh, if there's international expansion uh, proposed, great, it's a good story. But if there's no real connection and it's just going to be a company that's going to be based far, far away with very little contact with the UK, it's not really going to be very attractive. Victoria talked about the legal jurisdiction and corporate structure. Gone are the days, I think, when investors were quite happy about these overseas jurisdictions, the Cayman uh, and other places. I know it's, it's a really... Um, quite a big topic uh, in Asia about talking about where you can uh, where you can have your listing. Frankly, if you can have, establish a UK PLC, it really does make a difference. And from a tax perspective nowadays, um, there are a few disadvantages to doing that. The management has to be strong, credible, and they can't speak English. They really have to. They have to have UK-based directors so that investors will know that there will always be someone in the UK in our time zone that they can speak to in order to express concerns, get updates, ask questions. Very important that that closeness uh, is, is there. Financial performance of the business. Well, the stronger the track record, the better. There has to be an investment case that is credible. Why should a, a UK investor or European investor invest in this company? What is the investment case? Uh, and how do you do that? How do you establish that? Well, one of the things we do is when we float companies, we always produce pre-IPO research notes that actually outlines what the investment case is, outlines the valuation considerations. The more earnings visibility and cash generation that, that there is, the better. Uh, the potential to accelerate growth through funding, through acquisitions in the future, emphasizing the reason why you're raising capital in the UK. Very important to get those messages out. And that's where we help uh, to ensure that people really do understand that this is a company that they can believe in. Uh, and there's visibility uh, as to why uh, it's something you should invest in. And also, it, it, this, is, this is an important, further important consideration that investors have to really believe that you're going to generate returns for, for them if they become shareholders and that it really is a priority. We, we take it for granted that, yes, of course, we're going to generate uh, investment returns to investors, but it's something that you really do need to emphasise. Now, assuming all of this is the case for the company that is considering IPO, on the next slide, which I'd like to turn to now, we're going to look at the market. You need a strong team of advisors. Well, Charles also speechfully, well, they're a shoe in for the legals. So that's, that's sorted out. Uh, audit, well, you know, reputable firm, yeah, got to have it. Financial and broking, well, of course, that's why we're here and we're happy to talk to companies. Uh, the Asian experience really is essential because of the fact that there are the cultural differences, there are the time zone differences, and there's got to be that track record and confidence that, yeah, we're going to be able to manage the process carefully. The next point is possibly a little bit unusual, but it, I think it's very important. Local advisors in Asia who can help support effective communications between the company, between, potential, between Asian shareholders, Asian investors, uh, maybe get involved in the fundraising, 
It's very important. Uh, we really like working in partnership with Asian advisors. It makes such a difference. And of course, having Charlton's uh, on the ticket, clearly from a legal perspective, also uh, is a bit of a no-brainer as far as we're concerned. Strong corporate governance is extremely important. It's very high up on all investors' agendas. Corporate governance with regard to the composition of the board. Is the board going to represent uh, investors, shareholders uh, properly? And is it going to communicate to the market? So is it going to ensure that good disclosure is there? And also ensure that reporting of information, uh, as Victoria has outlined, um, is not only going to comply with what is required from a regulatory perspective, but also in terms of good shareholder market communications. That's very, very important. And then, of course, keeping that up, keeping a regular dialogue uh, through communications to investors and research. Research is something that really investors look to, because if there's research produced by a firm like us, and we always research our corporate clients, then investors and shareholders will know that there is support in the market for that company. Support in the sense of proper communication, proper dissemination of information, and forecasts against which the company can be measured. And therefore that goes straight to valuation and helps generate support for the companies. Free float liquidity, controlling shareholders. Well, you've got to clarify all of that, and make sure that that is, the ownership is clear uh, and understood and that confidence is given that, yeah, there is going to be liquidity. There is going to be sufficient free float. As a smaller company, as, as Alistair has talked about, Early on, not much liquidity, not much free float. But if one can express to investors and shareholders that this is a journey and that this is going to improve and increase as the company grows, these are messages that we help to, to convey. And that makes a big difference as far as investors are concerned because they understand the journey that they're going on to. Environmental, social and governance policies, ESG, very important. Investors in the UK take this, and Europe, take this very seriously. They have their own ESG duties and responsibilities. They have their own requirements, their own boxes to tick, if you like, to say that the companies that they are investing in, they have an approach to them to ensure that in, in deploying the capital that they have been entrusted with, that that capital is being deployed responsibly. So therefore, the better the communication uh, about environmental, social and governance uh, issues, the better it will be. And we can help with that. And so uh, all these issues will help to position the company and help to make a success. Key to starting on this journey is consultation with a corporate advisor, with your advisory team. Make sure you choose a good team Hopefully, the team that you're talking to today gives you confidence that, yeah, they're going to get you there and they're going to give you the advice and guidance that you need. But hopefully also, you'll the people on this uh, webinar, people also have a really good feel that Aquis as a market is now a genuine, compelling alternative for people to consider. You've really got to consider it. If you decide, well, no, actually, you want to go on saying, Fair enough, but you've got to consider it. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for these very interesting presentations. So um, I think we'll carry on for another 10 minutes or so, um, although um, we don't have a lot of time for questions. So if anybody who's joined us would like to ask some questions, I can see one coming up already in the Q&A, um, please put them in the Q&A or the chat room. Um, but I'd like to kick off perhaps and ask Alistair something, which I'm afraid is a bit out of left field, Alistair. What would you, would you be interested? Do you think Aquas would be interested if the regulations permitted and perhaps having a board in Hong Kong? Uh, would that be of something of interest ever to Aquas, do you think? Look, I mean, we have a three year strategic plan, um, which I'm, I'm not going to disclose entirely. We did a capital markets day. We're always looking at new and innovative ideas. Um, having a board in Hong Kong, um, uh, I, I would never rule anything out. Uh, our objective is to be a global exchange. We think we have the ability to change primary markets and secondary trading. Um, we certainly have a close relationship on the technology side. 
many of our technology clients are in uh, Singapore, Far East, etc. Um, so I would never rule something like that out. What we do need to do, though, is prove that it works in Europe first. Uh, that is absolutely essential. And, you know, I think in the way that NASDAQ proved what it could do in the United States before it came to Europe, we would do the same thing here. Right. And I guess this is a question perhaps to both you and to Andrew and to your colleague, Philip. Perhaps from what I understood, you see yourselves as a sort of more nascent NASDAQ than more similar to AIM. Would that be right? Uh, I'm willing to jump in there again. Is We want to have the same um, result that NASDAQ achieved, which is to create true competition. I'm a massive believer that competition creates innovation. And if you stifle competition, you stifle innovation. And this country in the United Kingdom needs that right now. Um, if you look at the Financial Services and Markets Bill, you know, the secondary objective there is competitiveness and growth. It just shows at the highest levels of government and the highest changes that are taking place, this competitiveness, this competition and growth is essential to the economy. And, you know, we are a solution to that. So I think we have a tremendous chance. It is so important to get out there. I, do I want to actually be NASDAQ itself? No, I think it runs on old technology. I think it's got some things, but it's got a history that has created that competition. And I want to do the same thing. Right. Thank you. I have some questions that have come in and one of them perhaps would lead on from that um, is what sort of valuation do you think Aquis might expect, especially for Chinese companies? And of course, I, that, I'm just raising that question first that's come in because I think that perhaps one of the attractions of NASDAQ has been some of the valuations they've managed to achieve. And obviously, that's a factor of the market, not just the platform. Right. This comes back to the symbiotic relationship, which is we want companies that are going to grow rapidly. If you have rapid growth, you're going to get higher valuations. And I think, you know, we've seen that effect take place in NASDAQ over the last 20 years. Of course, that does mean that there are certain companies that get highly valued there. And then we see a significant decline post IPO. Now, we don't want that to happen on the Aquis exchange. I think one has to be realistic as a company. It is not so much about you know, the, the, the company itself has to be growing at a rate to create the valuation and the multiple that it gets. We want to have a number of those companies there that will help others get the overall valuation. And that's the way it works. So I would reflect if somebody's bringing a company over and you want to just you're doing it to get the high valuation, look at your own growth model, look at what you can achieve and you will get the high valuation because any investor, doesn't matter what market you're on, wants to create, or wants to be invested in a company that's creating value. Right. So for the, an answer to that question, what sort of valuation Aquis might expect, especially for Chinese companies, is, is that the answer or is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, can I just comment, can I yeah. just comment uh, Alistair, yeah. on, on that point? I think a lot of this is about how a company presents itself as a company, as an investment case, what the growth projections are, is it properly communicating with the UK? And part of the problem in the past has been that companies have not been good at communicating uh, and, and adapting to the UK market and what investors expect. The more you communicate, the better you communicate, the, the, the research being out there, the full transparency about the business so people fully understand it, that helps valuation. And I think that's what I think is more important, if you like, than what, what sort of valuation levels would an Aquis company get? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thanks. Um, here's another question that someone has raised. Um, it says, Alistair mentioned market makers. Could you elaborate, please? And I think where this is partly coming from is that we don't really have market making in Hong Kong. I, I mean, that's a great question because we operate in the United Kingdom, um, what's known as the RSP model, the retail service provider model. Um, and, and Philip can add some points on here, but... The definition of a retail investor holding a UK stock to be able to put into a SIP, in other words, a self-invested pension plan or an ISA, a savings scheme, which have tax advantages, is that it is readily realizable. The words readily realizable, and that's quoted by HMRC, the tax authorities, is defined by the regulator, the FCA, as having two market makers. 
Now, this is my example of driving a 25, 35 year old car is these markets were designed 25, 30 years ago where two market makers did provide capital. But quite often today, market makers will provide a price in 500 pounds, not 500,000 pounds. Now, we're arguing with the regulators right now that that is not a sensible definition of readily realizable. In fact, we can connect literally millions of people in microseconds to establish price discovery through the technology we have, through auctions, through all sorts of things. And what we want to do is advance the market to use a better technology to get something that truly is readily realizable. In doing that, we think we can narrow quotes. Now, that doesn't mean excluding market makers. It means enhancing the market that we have today to make it a hybrid between quote driven and market making driven, maker, maker driven, in order to be able to get better prices for smaller stocks. And that's the issue is people do not want to trade on a 20 percent spread. Why? It's hard enough to make money as an investor. But what we need is narrower spreads and capability to trade at the right price. So that's what we're going to do. That's how we're moving forward. And the market making scheme, as it stands today, in my view, is yesterday's game. Whereas what we want to do is become tomorrow's market. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and a question actually for me, for Victoria and Philip. Um, I was wondering, what are the um, Aquis rules about independent non-executive directors? Um, I think I mentioned it briefly in yeah. talking. It's just one required for um, for the growth for the. Uh, sorry, you're going to have to tell me that that the, the, the um, access segment. Access segment. That's right. Uh, yes. And no. No. Um, reporting against no requirement to adopt a corporate governance code or report against it. And, and perhaps you could explain, Philip, about the, the um, apex market requirement. Yeah. So um, for the apex, to start, start with, with, for the apex segment, you need to adopt a, a recognised corporate governance code. And that will be a, a code, the, typically the QCA code, which is proportionate levels of corporate governance for growth companies. Uh, and that code has a requirement of having a majority, at least two non-executive directors on your board. Mm -hmm. For our access segment, however, we need to recognize, and this is the great thing about our rules, is these are very early stage companies. They're starting on their growth journey. They're led by entrepreneurs. Uh, so there's only a minimum requirement of having one independent non-exec director. But going to Andrew's point, uh, you need to be mindful of who your investors are. What, what sort of capital do you want to attract? And those investors are always going to value companies that have good corporate governance, that have uh, more independent non-exec directors on their board as something that they will tick their box and say, this is a better company for me to invest in. So it depends on, you know, again, our rules are designed uh, to, you know, allow entrepreneurship, but there are going to be other interests there and there might be other objectives uh, which your advisors will advise you on. Similar similar applies to the different sort of accounting stands you can adopt. Often uh, UK institutional investors will want a particular accounting standard. And it's not necessary under our rules, but if you want to track that capital, then your advisors will make suggestions as to what sort of standards you should apply. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, Victoria, this is more conversation briefly for you and me. Of course, I just wanted to make it clear that if a Hong Kong or Asia-based company was listing on an, on Aquis, they could still do a placing in Hong Kong, right? Complying with the placing regulations in Hong Kong. Or is there any requirement for how, what percentage of shareholders has to be in the UK or anything like that? No, they used to be under um, the full yeah. exit, um, under the, um, if you were doing, a, a, you had to have 25%, and the rules have changed completely. Yes. Um, in in EEA member states, mm. that, that's that's all gone now. So they could right. be. There. I see Philip um, nodding his his head, but yes. yeah. Okay. And is there a minimum yeah. number of shareholders that a company has to have to list? Yeah. Very different from Hong Kong, of course. Right. I, you and I have talked about this before. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, they got to have your free float. So, mm. but but um, I yeah, no minimum. No minimum, thank you. And here's a question from someone who's participating saying, what's the view position of, position of Aquis on carbon credit, 
carbon credit trading or climate related token exchange or similar digital assets? Alistair, perhaps? Well, we're, we're a technology provider to a number of um, exchanges around the world. So in, in, the, in the sort of digital space and the crypto space, we provide a lot. Carbon credits and climate related products, I think, become more and more interesting, um, more and more common out there. In fact, you've seen the European exchange. I've seen uh, you know, the, the Athens exchange, et cetera, all involved in these things. And, and we certainly, uh, I wouldn't say we haven't discussed this, we have discussed this. If an opportunity comes for us to be involved, we will certainly look at it. And I think it is something that the United Kingdom would be, it'd be very good to have an exchange in the UK looking at these. So on the cards, but nothing. Right. But the answer is if someone was interested, they could come and talk to you. Would that be Absolutely, true? Absolutely, we would. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right. And Philip, perhaps, are there any requirements for ESG reporting for companies listed? No, there isn't. Again, as a growth company, uh, you know, these are growth companies. They're, yeah. they're, you know, we don't want to overburden them with regulatory standards. Again, if you want to attract a certain type of investor, then Andrew and and the likes of uh, your corporate finance advisor will will give certain recommendations. But, uh, you know, the key key driver for a lot of early stage companies is uh, improving their revenue, improving their profitability. Uh, and growing um, and ESG can be a part of that to varying degrees. Thank you. Thanks. And I think there's another question here. We'll probably make this the last one. How much interest has there been in Hong Kong from Hong Kong small cap companies in Aquis so far? And the question also comments, well, maybe more after this webinar. So <laughs> has there been interest up to now? I think there has because I was actually involved in advising one at one point, although it didn't go ahead. But there has been interest. There has been interest internationally about what we're doing. Mm. I think what is important for us, though, is that we need awareness. Um, you know, what we haven't been good is we've concentrated on our core business before doing the stock exchange primary markets. And we didn't really need to uh, go beyond the sort of 100, 120 potential customers that one can have in that in that business. Mm. In running a primary market, it's really, really different. Um, one of the things I certainly want to explore is that we offer equivalents to fast track businesses from one exchange to another. Now, we don't believe we'll get equivalents from by the Hong Kong exchange uh, to offer anything, but we offer equivalents amongst the CSE, the ASX, and we would look at one way equivalents within Hong Kong as well. You know, so you would look at one way equivalent. So, for example, if a company was listed on GEM, the, the market here, you might say, well, because you're listed on GEM, we can fast track right. you. You might do that. Review the market. We would have to look at the equivalence uh, and, and whether that was possible. Um, and then we'd obviously look at the stock independently uh, as, as to whether it was appropriate. But yes, I, I certainly want to explore the opportunity that if something is on GEM, they might be able to fast track to raise capital in the UK and Europe. That's extremely interesting, I think. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think we could have chatted for a lot longer, but I think there's a lot more things we could talk about perhaps another time. But we're already um, 15 minutes over the allotted time. So I'd like to thank each of um, the speakers and our panelist, Philip, so much for joining us. You've really been fascinating. We've all learned such a lot. And thank you to everybody who's joined our webinar today. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. Bye.